Uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, now we start the public lecture uh, by Dr. Kasturi Rangan on the national education policy, uh, which is still the draft uh, national education policy. Uh, may I request uh, our Vice Chancellor for Saparov Kodile uh, to accompany uh, our guest, uh, Chief Guest, Dr. Kasturi Rangan, onto the stage. Good morning, everybody. Dr. Kasturi Rangan, our chief guest and the speaker for today's lecture, invited guests and faculty and students from University of Hyderabad. It is a unique opportunity for University of Hyderabad to host a lecture by none other than the chairman who has steered the committee that has drafted the new education policy for the country. On behalf of University of Hyderabad and on behalf of everybody here and on my personal behalf, I extend a warm welcome to Professor Kasturi Rangan on this occasion. New education policy has been debated even while it is at its formulation stage and now it is on the, it is in the open domain for several of us to respond before the government can make it into a, a policy. Several things have been brought about in the policy and a lot of discussions are happening, several inputs are already received by the government and science academies also have been debating on it and then made a draft suggestions from the science academies, likewise from several people, the inputs on the draft policy are there. But we all have the opportunity to listen to the chairman who chaired these deliberations for more than a year and then brought out the policy for all of us and we would be listening to him on this day at University of Hyderabad. That's where I felt that this is a, a great opportunity for University of Hyderabad to have him here for this lecture. I know as an eminent person like Dr. Kasturi Rangan doesn't require any introduction to any audience in the country. But it is very important for us to know what kind of contributions that he has made for the country. Today, Dr. Kasturi Rangan is the chairman for the Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics. He is the chancellor for the Central University of Rajasthan. He is the Chairman Public Affairs Center, Bangalore. He is the Chairman for Karnataka Knowledge Commission. He is Member Atomic Energy Commission, an Emeritus Professor at National Institute of Advanced Sciences in Bangalore, an Honorary Distinguished Advisor, Indian Space Research Organization, an organization which he has served uh, with passion. Earlier, he was the Chairman ISRO, that is Indian Space Research Organization, and he oversaw the space program of India between the years 1994 to 2003. He was a member upper house of the Indian parliament during 2003-2009 and concurrently the director of National Institute of Advanced Sciences Bangalore subsequently he was a member of the erstwhile planning commission and which we are now calling Niti Aayog. Dr. Kasturi Rangan was also the chairman of the committee entrusted with drafting the new education policy which we are talking about today. In July 2007, he started this uh, uh, exercise. His interests include astrophysics, space science and technology, as well as science-related policies. 
Dr. Kasturi Rangan is a member of several international and national science academies. He is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences and also served as the president of the academy during 2001 to 2003. He is a fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineering and was its president during 2005-2006. He was also general president of the Indian Science Congress Association for the years 2002 to 2003. Besides, he is a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy and the Indian Academy of Sciences of India. Dr. Kasur Rangan is the only Indian to be conferred the honorary membership of the International Academy of Astrophysics and having served and having served as its vice president earlier. He is a member of the International Astronomical Union and a fellow of the World Academy of Sciences that is TWS. He is the honorary fellow of the Cardiff University, UK, and Academician of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, that's Vatican City. He has won, won several awards, including a Brock Medal of International Society of Phytogrammetry and Remote Sensing, that was in 2004. Alan D. Emil Memorial Award of the International Astronautical Federation that was in 2004 again. Therefore, uh, Theodore, Theodore won Kerman Award by International Academy of Astrophysics that was in 2007. Of course, a scientist of his caliber uh, has been honored with Santiswaru Bhatnagar Award in Engineering and an Aryabhata Award in 2003 of Astronomical Society of India and a Lifetime Achievement of our Award of Asia Pacific. Satellite Communication Council, Singapore. Aryabhatta Medal by the Indian National Science Academy in 2000 and uh, Ashutosh Mukherjee Memorial Award by the Indian Science Congress, Award of Jewel of Ruya, that is Rural College, Ruya College Alumni Association in 2007, Maharana Uday Singh Award 2007-2008 by Maharana of Mewar Charitable Foundation, Udaipur and Raja Yogindra Award, Maharaja of Mysore, 2008. Vikram Sarabhai Memorial Gold Medal, Indian Science Congress, 2009. My dear friends, these are just a few of the several honors that have, that have been conferred on Dr. Kasturi Rangan. Well, all of all of you may be aware that he has been conferred with the civilian honors by the country. He has been a Padma Shri awardee. He was, he was also honored with Padma Bhushan and also Padma Vibhushan by the President of India. He has received the award of Officer of the Legion the Honor by the President of the French Republic, France. I only hope very soon, our government of India will honor him with the highest civilian honor, Bharat Ratna, very soon. <laughs> Such a great personality amidst of us, a simple man, a man who has helped the nation in several capacities, is with us today to share his experiences and thoughts on the draft of the new education policy that is in front of all of us. I don't want to take more time. I would now like to request Dr. Kasuri Rangan to give his uh, lecture. Uh, good morning and thanks uh, Professor Aparo, the Chance Vice Chancellor uh, for those introductory remarks. Uh, I would like to thank you and the management of the university for giving me this unique privilege of being with all of you today morning, share my own thoughts and also give you a gist of the kind of policy that uh, has been uh, prepared uh, by the committee set up for this purpose and which is currently in the public domain. Uh, one of the important tasks, we as the members of the committee and many others who are a part of the preparation, either in the drafting or in many other cases, decided that 
this kind of a policy certainly needs interaction considerably with all those who are interested in the matter of education and so we have taken upon ourselves to interact with the public to the you know, with, with the knowledgeable segment of the society to the maximum extent possible from our side to ensure that at least our thoughts and the spirit with which it has been prepared is properly projected to all concerned so when professor aparo called me and told me that i should come and give a talk here at the university and make it a public lecture i gladly agreed and today i am here with all of you coming of course to the university of hyderabad is a very unique experience i should say it is one of the best universities in this country i don't have to say this to this place i do know it has kept up a consistently high standard of performance excellence yes and really uh, has not it is not not the question of only few papers or few achievements but there has been an overall consistent performance of excellence from this institution we had such what i may say legendary figures heading this institution i know i see here the morning professor govardhan mehta you i don't think that i should say much about professor Me- govardhan mehta here but he has been one of those people who really have inspired people like us in making sure that education and knowledge creation is not purely a matter of profession but it should flow down in your blood if you want to really do justice and he himself has practiced it even today he does research work in area of chemistry and related subjects he publishes papers and most importantly quality papers and provides the best of advice scientific advice technical advice and other kind of intellectual inputs to organizations not only uh, in india but all over the world including being the president only the second president of this, from this country in the iupop the international union for uh, you know, physics and the uh, the allied subjects and so i'm very happy that he could make it because i know he's a busy person he does work in all kinds of things and therefore uh, i was not sure whether i'll have this privilege of seeing him today and i'm happy that i could see him and i'm very thankful because i think he's one of the person whom i also value as a friend there are many others professor rama rao has been here and i have worked with professor rama rao for a long period professor kota hatai harinarayana is another of those persons and now of course and we have professor apara who is for carrying forward the rich legacy that these leaders have set for this university and keeping up the the, the performance at the highest level that the country continues to recognize as one of the best centers of education and knowledge creation and i think if as i move forward and say something about the higher education and the restructuring of the higher education in the context of institutions i'm sure that this institution certainly ranks the highest in terms of the priority of converting it into a research university something which is the best that one can expect at least as per this and i think you have all the credentials to convert yourself into a research university and thus occupy a position which automatically brings you to the world rankings in terms of your performance having said a few of these i'm also happy to see that we have a number of teachers senior teachers here from various institutions in south india and i think this, this particular opportunity of interaction also has been extended to them because they happen to be here on a conference or a seminar and also the interest in the uh, document the, in the document itself is evident in the context of the type of interest that all of you are here a large number and i have found this to be the case in many places where i went i went to rajasthan in jaipur recently i was in bombay and of course in other places but i think there has been a tremendous enthusiasm to learn the subtle aspects of this particular uh, um, policy and see for themselves what is it that is that is going to provide as an educational direction for this country in the coming years so i am extremely happy that there is a response and there the response normally will be there when there is an interest to read and there is an interest to read if there is something that something to read so to that extent i would assume that there is something to read in this document which is worthwhile and worthwhile to be commented upon which also is quite liberal in terms of the number of suggestions that we have got very good suggestions very thoughtful ones and certainly this will be reviewed with respect to finalizing this uh, document 
the need for a new national policy, they were often asking. In fact, I'm trying to put these things in a perspective because in the last one month, wherever I go, they also ask these kind of questions as to the need for a new national policy. What is it that we are going to bring in new, which we don't have as a policy? And where are we going wrong? Is it in implementation only? And why should we be doing work was wasting our time and creating policies when we have to really do is to make sure that all the elements of the previous policies uh, are addressed to. Yes, one important thing is we need to certainly look at the earlier policies. Look at the policies which are to be done even today because they are relevant. And where they have gone wrong or where we could not do to the same extent that the policy wanted it to be done. What are the reasons why we could not do it? So these are questions certainly that is to be asked and we have asked for ourselves in this question in the context of formulating this policy. But you will understand that it's 25 years since we formulated the last policy. And there have been extensive changes in the society since the last policy, social, economic, industrial, cultural, each has its own ramifications on education. Then increasing and ubiquitous technology usage, you see internet, if you, if you really look at it, internet was yet to make a major foray into the uh, society at the time when the last policy was done and you knew the kind of Im implications in the impact that it is creating on all aspects of the human endeavor and particularly in this country and in education in particular. So this is something which was not foreseen in the preparation of the last, uh, last particular policy. The fourth industrial revolution is around the corner and there's going to have really disruptive impact on various aspects of the national efforts, just like it is going to be in the international effort. And this has again its own ramifications in the education. And there are the Sustainable Development Goal, the SDG4. The alignment with this is extremely important in the, in the context of India's global role and ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all by 2030. That is a kind of a goal and we need to be aligned with that kind of a goal of the Millennium uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Understanding, I mentioned about a little earlier, the need to understand the pitfalls in the earlier programs and the earlier policies. That what is it we need to do? How do we revisit it? How do we see it in the present context and where they are still relevant? And if so, how do we ta tackle this? Addressing, of course, the questions of uh, where we went wrong. And of course, when I met the minister, at that time it was uh, Javadekar ji, uh, he, he told me only one thing, that uh, don't create this policy as a fine tuning of the what, what has gone so far. I would like to have a policy which is valid at least for two decades. So we should make sure that this policy will be applicable to developments and evolution of things in the next two decades. And at that particular point, if necessary, we should be able to fine tune this policy to make it sure that one more decade it should be valid. So it's a kind of a thing in which we have to give a lot of thought because it's a 30 year period over which we have to make this policy valid or applicable. And secondly, 20, we have a very clear cut director thing that in 20, for 20 years it should be valid. So there was this question of debate of what is this 20 years going to be representing to? And some of the points that I just mentioned certainly are drivers in terms of what we should look as a policy. And of course, we need to have also the pragmatism in implementation, which is a key consideration because we cannot give hypothetical suggestions and then try to look for the country to implement them, uh, which may or may not be the way it should be going. Uh, now, just uh, let us look at the policy journey. Mm, you know, we had a good experts, really experts in various areas who helped us to formulate this policy. They may not be that well known in terms of what we normally consider as people, as experts and well known, but they were all people who have worked throughout their life, understood the issues of education in the various segments of the education and the various ecosystems of education. And that is where we have the Vasudha Kamat who was of course, the, she was the Vice Chancellor of the SNDT University in Mumbai. Manjul Bhargav, I'm sure many of you know him. He is a mathematician who is a field medalist from Princeton University. He came down several times to have this meet, attend these meetings on his own. And he, was, he took one year sabbatical from Princeton. Why I'm telling this is just to tell you the kind of passion with which these people have worked in trying to look at 
the best input that would go into this document. So he was coming and he was, and then when he was in U.S., between him and the people who were drafting here, it was a 24 by 7 cycle. That is how they wrote the document. Even though it took six months to write the document with all kinds of changes and rechanges, it was an enormous task. But they did it with this kind of a dedication and sincerity. I thought I should mention that too. And that shows also for the rest of them, whether it's Ram Shakur Kuri, Lua Katimani, Krishna Mohanthra Party, Mashar Sarin, who was a language expert, and M.K. Sridhar, who was a super organizer, or Zakila Samtu, very dynamic in terms of providing secretarial assistance. They were all people with the deepest commitment that I can extend. Of course, I have seen dedication in your space. But I thought it was a very refreshing thing to see that space is not an island. It is there is this something which is very much there and it is with much higher force that these people brought to bear in writing this document, in creating this document. We had a drafting committee. We had also a number of even the discussions with educators, researchers, policy makers, sector experts, industry, academies, community groups and of course engaged citizens. And one important thing we said is that we put it down into the website that we are willing to see anybody anywhere, whether it is Delhi, Bangalore or any other places where we go. And uh, we were willing to hear patiently what their views are. Of course, they have to have some level of credential so that we don't waste our time on all things. But by and large, we got a large number of individuals and groups. Uh, there were something like 70 organizations which came forward to discuss these institutions and associations. And at least 200 and odd eminent individuals, many of them just came forward and said that we would like to have a half a day view discussion, one hour view discussion with you. And they gave their own personal views and experiences in the in the related matters in which they are. The lands is very much worn, and we do this very often in scientific research and also in space we do this, we create some peer reviews. I thought that even though we may create all this in the early phase of finalizing the document, at least we should go through some peer reviewing process. And we had some very good people drawn from different walks of life, Jay Prakash Narayan, Rama Rao here, Jay Espinar, Vijay Kelkar, and Dinesh Singh Mohandas Pai and so on and so forth. They all served, they were willingly came forward, they said that they will re review this and several pages of opinions in the early phase of this preparation of this document they sent to us by carefully re reading each and every page of this particular document in the early phase. So this is other kind of a thing. And of course, we also fall back on the earlier policy document, whether it is 1968, 1986 or 1992. And also the report that was prepared earlier as a part of this exercise, which was the report of TSR Subramaniam, a very efficient and uh, cabinet secretary that uh, we had earlier and he had there was a committee under him during the time when um, the, the previous education minister uh, entrusted this job and uh, he wrote a good document there were some questions uh, that were raised and then we were asked to revisit and so that is the beginning of our own committee thing was to revisit some of the major issues on which there were no no clarity or no meeting point with respect to certain sensitive matters and of course, then MHRD prepared its own report, which was also used as a basis. And uh, three to four years of consultation that the ministry, uh, uh, which was done to, uh, by the ministry under Srimadhi Smriti Virani ji, in terms of consultation at the grassroots level, also created a lot of information, a fund of a number of documents, which were also the basis uh, for our further work in which we use this. Now, the elements of the policy, I just summarized this because when I asked Professor Aparao that what is the portion which I should emphasize more, he suggested that higher education is the thing that we should have more at discourse here. And therefore, the school part of it, I will just say that we have brought some new aspects of school education. The early child care and education part of it, the ECCE, now, the home education right from the day the child is born, what is to be done to create because the mind has, the brain has started growing right at that particular point. The role of Anganwadis in this particular case and the preschool education, the nature and the kind of thing that we need to bring in. This is all to make sure that we take full advantage of the brain, brain growth, the early faith of the child, especially between three years and six years when 83% of the brain growth occurs. How do we take advantage of it, whether it is learning languages, whether it is learning mathematics, or whether it is learning science, or other kinds of subjects. Uh, the brain has its own responses to this, and this is not a uniform growth for all the children. They are varying types, 
So we need to address this in the early phase because we cannot assume that there is a linear way in which we will address the growth of the brain and the corresponding pedagogy and a curriculum that we develop. This we brought a major thing mainly based on the fact that there had been a lot of research or such outcomes were there. We did consult Dr. Vinita Kaur from Delhi. On this particular area, she has spent her lifetime on the question of the brain growth of children and the corresponding implications with respect to their learning characteristics. And so this is one thing which we did. So the first portion has been put with respect to that in mind. And correspondingly, the school system also developmentally appropriate education is what we would like to call it. And uh, this made sure that the early preparatory thing for the child to learn, to absorb, is not through regular books and teachers and so on. There is a foundational period, a preparatory period, and then a middle period, in which case so the teachers come in, the prescriptive approach to the learning comes in, and then go to the secondary. The foundation itself will be a five years, starting from three years of age, and then preparatory, which is three years, medial, which will be three years, and secondary, which is four years. And by the time you reach secondary, you are in a position to also have some feeling of certain type of vocational, vocational experience. And this helps you, for example, if you want to be interested in doing a little bit on agriculture, something related to environment, something of understanding the water and that kind of a thing. And also many other local activities on which the vocational skill can be brought in. Uh, so these are all embedded into it. So it's a very flexible system of education encompassing several dimensions of education, including several subjects and expertise that comes in. So it does need, a, we have made correspondingly a total overhaul of the system uh, from the earlier uh, versions of the periods as well as the type of curriculum that uh, is being followed, primarily keeping in mind that there is a developmentally appropriate approach to the education which we have to follow right to the school stage. It's a 15-year school uh, stretch and it will be covered by a RTE fully with respect to right from the age 3 to age 18. And there is, once you do that, you are ready for going straight into the undergraduate education. Or of course, we want to take up some vocational education, you can branch off and things of that kind. But what is significant is the PUCs, the intermediates and those kind of a thing. I think we have, dealt, we have convert, covered, covered all of them under the school education and go straight to the undergraduate education as the next step. Of course, the undergraduate education will come a little bit more now and then postgraduate and uh, masters and PhDs and adult education, lifelong learning. These are the other parts of the education with this country has to grapple with. And of course, in the context of the structuring, we have also made sure that there is a way of dealing with the, the, the governance part of it, uh, which we will come a little later, so I won't touch upon that. And the technology role and the policy making is other part of it. And ultimately, an overall governance, uh, which is the highest level, we have proposed a what is called as a Rashtriya Shiksha Ayog, uh, which will be uh, overseen at the highest level by a committee which would be chaired by the Prime Minister himself. Let us now go and look at the higher education, uh, which is the next point. That I come straight to the higher education part of the world. I don't think to this erudite audience I need to bring much about the higher education's relevance, except for the fact that we need, as a growing country, as economically India becoming strong, the developing ideas, innovation that enlighten individuals and help propel the country towards socially, culturally, artistically, scientifically, technologically and economically from all dimensions of the country's growth. We need to bring in the higher education as an important component of a national knowledge exercise, building exercise. And as it becomes a true knowledge society and economy, in view of the forthcoming fourth industrial revolution, I talked about it a little earlier, where India aims to lead and where an increasing portion of employment opportunities will consist of skilled jobs of a creative and multidisciplinary nature, more and more young Indians are aspiring for higher education. I don't think that I need to say this again here. Accordingly, the higher education system in India must at the earliest be readjusted, revamped and re-energized to fulfill these important and noble aspirations of the people. Higher education must form the basis for knowledge creation and innovation in the nation and thereby contribute deeply to the growing national economy. It should be emphasized that the higher education must build expertise to the society with need for the next 25 years and beyond. This is of course the earlier direction also from the minister. 
similarly tailoring people for jobs that exist today but are likely to change or disappear after some years is suboptimal and even counterproductive the future workplace will demand critical thinking communication problem solving creativity and multidisciplinary capability single skill and single discipline jobs are likely to become automated over time and therefore lose their relevance as a profession so these are the considerations that have been kept while formulating what we considered as the directions for india's higher education of future now what are the issues regarding the present have many of us know what the issues are of the higher education if you really look at it there are many deficiencies 93% of undergraduate enrollment is in state universities again a matter that is known extreme fragmentation nearly 1000 universities 40000 colleges and over 10000 stand alone institution educating 36 million students 40% of colleges teach only single discipline a large part of which are teacher education colleges nearly 20% colleges have environment below 100 uh, enrollment below 100 and only 4% have enrollment above 3000 too many silos and too many early education too, too many early specialization streaming of students with disciplines lack of access in socio economically disadvantaged areas lack of teacher and institutional autonomy and inadequate mechanisms for career and progression of faculty lack of research culture suboptimal governance leadership poor regulation fake colleges we can just see just to give a flavor of the kind of problems that plague our higher education uh, today so what have we done we have tried to look at the various options and models and the way in which the existing system can be restructured of course the existing system is sometimes it would be drastic and one is the consolidation of the 900 universities 40000 colleges into something like 15000 well resourced large vibrant multidisciplinary institution that is the crux the core of the way in which we want to approach the restructuring of the higher educational system the higher educational institution to move uh, bec- towards becoming one of the three types of institution so under the new structuring it will come under three broad classes one is of course the research universities where equal focus will be on research and teaching it may about 100 to 200 is what we are envisaging in the next 20 years but they are top class and when you when you want to draw a parallel not necessarily there will be an indigenous seed and there will be a way in which it will be done for this country but something like what you have like stanford and those kind of institution that is the research institution that we are talking of as a research university the second is a teaching university primarily if they focus on teaching with significant focus on research which is very much recognizing the fact that their research can make a difference to the quality of teaching and they have to be together and that is exactly what this university they will primarily be teaching universities high quality teaching but they will have research component and lastly a large and this could be about 2000 kind of a number 1500 2000 of these universities the third level is the autonomous degree granting colleges focus on undergraduate education and research high quality that's the most important and we'll see the components of what a undergraduate education uh, would be in the context of ensuring that they have on one side the quality and the job relevance uh, in the emerging economy of this country significantly expand reach the capacity by building strong educational communities all higher education institution to become multidisciplinary institutions with teaching programs across disciplines and fields there is something that is there in this for example in this university you have this kind of character in terms of the number of programs the discipline that you are chosen and the spread in which uh, these kind of knowledge is there in trying to create a knowledge base from this university then high quality institutions for the disadvantaged geography this we have come quite a bit of care in trying to see look at the areas of um, the disadvantaged geographies uh, under privileged sections of the society and things of that kind and then substantial public investment we think the ultimate of course education should have a substantial commerce not than philanthropy as well as private uh, funding for this kind of educational institution is not important they are important but i think we need to substantially increase the present level of uh, the public investment 
and it should be treated not as an expenditure but as an investment. I now come to what you call as the quality liberal education while dealing with the, the undergraduate uh, education. <coughs> uh, let us see this. Uh, you know, the policy envisages imaginative and broad-based liberal undergraduate education with rigorous specialization in chosen discipline and fields. What are these elements? Critical thinking, there is one of the key elements in that, that one has in mind, statistics, data analysis and quantitative methods is one example. It spreads all across various disciplines if you really critically look at it. Communication skills, courses in writing, speaking, something which is very direly needed in many cases in terms of the ability to be a good professional in the job that you undertake in anywhere in this country or elsewhere. Aesthetic sensibilities, music, visual art, theatre. The overall contents of a liberal education will encompass scientific temper and methods, history, diversity, constitutional values, there are ethical reasoning, morals and so on. And the subjects covered will include arts, humanities, science, mathematics, sports and society. And of course, in trying to do this as a part of an undergraduate education, we also will have the even encompassing all these will be the options to choose major and minor. You can have a physics major, a philosophy minor and those kind of, you are very familiar with these kind of choices now emerging as possibilities in the Institute of Science uh, has some of these kind of interesting aspects slowly being evaluated. Provision for research in the final year, the, that is, this is the, the undergraduate program of four years and include community service. So this is just to give you the kind of thing that we have in mind when it comes to the liberal education. The whole idea of the liberal education in this connection is to make sure that we have the, the creativity, the creative and the aesthetic aspects of it are fully brought out as a part of an educational program. That is exactly what the liberal education here means. And you consider the entire knowledge as something called as a liberal arts. And in the ancient India, they used to call it the 64 colors. Liberal education with broad multidisciplinary exposure here means imaginative and flexible curriculum. You can now cross link any subject with any subject and you will try to find imaginatively a relationship between the two or multiple subjects, creative combinations of disciplines of study, multiple exit and entry points. This is an important provision that we are trying to make in undergraduate education. You have a four-year undergraduate education which will lead to a bachelor's degree. Uh, the first year, if you want to exit after a first year education in this kind of a mode, uh, certainly you have the freedom to do that. And also at a later date, say five years later, you want to get back to the education, uh, you can again make an entry with certain minimum provisions being fulfilled and therefore in the first year you can live with a certificate, in the second year you can live with a diploma, in the third year you can live with a degree and fourth year with a research and a background you can also have an honours kind of a thing along with the undergraduate degree. So you have the exits and entry possible on all the four years of undergraduate education. And the three to four hundred accordingly with multiple options would be four year program, which is a Bachelor of Liberal Arts, Education, Bachelor of Science and things of that kind. Of course, you have the major and minor concepts here. The three year program, which is a bachelor's degree, three and four year program leading to degree with honors with research work and exit with a two year advanced diploma or a one year degree. So this is the kind of provisions, flexibility that exists in an undergraduate education, but bringing in the question of flexibility and as well as a large choices that will be available in terms of linking and which would be necessarily be an imaginative and flexible curricular uh, structures. And of course that leads us to the flexible ma master's degree program, two years for those with three year undergraduate, one year for four year undergraduate and integrated five year programs. So these are the other aspects of an undergraduate program uh, with quality liberal education uh, as an underlying concept. I will not go too much into the student support for learning and except for the fact the policy also envisages a joyful, rigorous and responsive curriculum. We, this is something that we have debated in every aspect of the discussion on the policy and that's why I'm just pro t telling them about this. Effective pedagogy, caring support to optimize learning and the overall development of the students. Uh, so this of course there is a fairly large amount of discussion that is there in the, the policy document. I am sure you can have a look at it, I don't want to go into the details of this for the lack of time.
Then they energized, engaged and capable faculty, something which is very, I mean, everybody looks for this. Uh, one of the problems, there are many problems and at the same time, there are directions that are possible based on the previous experiences and also with the new development that we have uh, in the field of education, technology and so on. The most important factor for access of higher education institution is the quality and engagement of it. I don't have to re-emphasize this. This policy puts faculty back in the heart of the higher education. Rampant practice of contractual appointments, contract and ad hoc, especially clock hour basis, needs to be phased out. Very heavy teaching loads need to be rationalized to give faculty time to invest in themselves. Infrastructure support, mostly faculty do not even have staff rooms. These are the kind of things we have considered. The details to which we have considered in trying to plan the faculty and the type of environment in which we can get the best out of the faculty. Faculty recruitment and development plan, career progression and compensation management to be part of every institutional development plan announced by the higher educational institutions. Appropriately designed permanent employment tenure back system to be in place in all institutions by 2030. We have enunciated what that kind of entertainment track can be in the policy and this can be debated and can be adopted by different states depending on what is the best under those circumstances. Faculty to be autonomous, empowered to make curricular choices and conduct assessment of students. So this is something you don't try to go with uh, certain guidelines and to be strict guidelines. Uh, you have the necessary autonomy to decide on this kind of a thing. This needs to be brought in as one of the empowerment that the faculty should have. Infrastructure for continuous professional development for all faculty, they have to be strengthened. There are several institutions in this country under this uh, heading. Uh, but I think they need to be reviewed, they need to be reconfigured. And uh, also we have to be made more effective in the context of the better tools that are available today, including the role of technology. Career pass into education, administration, teacher education, uh, these are not very well laid out in the present context. And this is one thing in which the policy has gone into the detail and given specific directions in which the faculty also can look forward to higher growth as a professional uh, into careers at the higher level of a higher level of demands on their performance. If, now I come to another important area, which of course is of very much interest to this university, which is related to the research and innovation fund that we are proposing under this policy on the higher education. The research in, and innovation leading to knowledge creation is central to growing and sustaining a large and vibrant economy and uplifting society. I think it's a general statement, but an important statement. A robust ecosystem of research is today more relevant than ever in the context of climate change, population dynamics, biotechnology, expanding legal digital marketplace, and the rise of machine learning and artificial intelligence and at the very basis the question of creating a knowledge base which from which you can draw upon for solutions that is needed by the society or economic growth and many other activities. That kind of a knowledge base, how strong it is will determine, dictate the economic and industrial strength of this country and that is where we need to ring it because we have more less than the required uh, level at which uh, this is carry, being carried on today. If you look at the European Union, I put this specifically to get a feel of the kind of thing that India could certainly should achieve, uh, considering that there have been very good examples of the two-thirds of the economic growth of Europe, 1995 and 2007, came from research and innovation. Research and innovation accounted for 15% of all productivity gains, which is 2000 and 2013, and that an annual increase of 0.2% of GDP in R&D would result in an annual increase of 1.1% uh, in GDP, a five-fold return. <coughs> this is the kind of a thing. Uh, we often, when we sit and discuss across and see how much the government is putting as research money, and we say it's 0.6% of GDP, 0.8% or 0.9, this year is 0.9 and become 0.85, and this kind of a thing. We always talk of how much of our GDP we are able to flow into the research. Now these are the people, these are the countries, they discuss the question of how much science is feeding into the GDP growth. I think we have to reverse the trend and this is exactly the spirit of what we are trying to say in this particular paragraph. India's present R&D investment is about 0.7% need to be compared with the corresponding figures of 2.1% in China, 2.8% and you remember they, when you talk of US, we are really talking of several fold trillion 
uh, as a strength of the economy uh, in which you are trying to deal, deal with this kind of a thing, 15, 14 or 15 trillion against 2 or 2 and a half trillion that we are talking of. And there you are talking of a 4, uh, 2.8 percent of the GDP. So that is the kind of the actual number is even more significant and Israel and South Korea and so on. This in turn has led to a number of researchers per lack of hours is pathetically low, 15 in India compared to 11 in China, 111 in China, 423 in US, 825 in Israel. Other attendant impacts include low level of patent applications as well as scientific publications. Obviously, this will be the offshoot of the kind of low level of operations. So, accordingly, what we have tried to recommend is a strong emphasis on catalyzing and energizing research and innovation across the country in all academic disciplines with particular focus on state universities and colleges. I did mention that the research in the state universities is the one of the great concern. This is pathetic, I should say. And a fund to seed research in all universities and colleges so that the synergies between the research and the quality education can be leveraged maximally. National Research Fund will research across all disciplines and significantly expand research and innovation in all universities and colleges, including private institutions. Uh, we have to have a policy to support private institutions if they put certain capability, create a capability. There is no reason why we cannot support them to a limited extent to make sure that capability turns itself into meaningful research outcomes. We will have four major divisions to start with. Sciences, Technology, Social Sciences, Arts and Humanities with provision. In fact, yesterday, uh, Professor Govardhan Mehta did ask whether we have included the other areas of research uh, in the Science Foundation. Uh, I want to assure that there are four areas now which cover, covers both Arts and Humanities as well as Social Sciences. And I may also say that we have discussed the question of a futuristic expansion into other areas like the professional areas, engineering, agriculture and so on and so forth. But this is basically what we should start with, that's what we felt. Scope of work will include funding research through a competitive peer review process, this is what we do. Building research capacity of academic institutions across the country through mentorship for submitting proposals and for conducting research. Mentorship is the key word there and uh, we need to have people who can provide this kind of a mentorship. The country has many, but I don't think they do the mentorship that we are looking for. And I think we need to create policies that will enable them to come over and do this. Creating beneficial linkages between researchers, government and industry. Everybody talks about it. Uh, certainly, we need to bring a little more effectiveness into this kind of an approach. And disseminating research through seminars and this is just, uh, certainly an outcome that we should be doing. There are many details on this, what, uh, how, what kind of structure we will have, whether it will be an act of the parliament, whether it will be a governing board and how will you deal with the multiple subjects and how do you spread it across the country, how do you create mentorship, how do you, what kind of rules and regulations are there in terms of monitoring, what kind of risk element there are, there will be quite a lot about the risk element that comes over. We cannot just say that the public money is being wasted on research. The question of the uncertainties in the research area. Uh, it certainly has been one of the focus in respect of justification of this kind of a money in an area which needs to be supported so that it pays for itself at a future date and you saw what the European Union has taken advantage of. And so these aspects have been considered and accordingly we need to create a system by which this is managed fully understanding the uncertainties, the risks and at the same time the potential of outcomes which could be very significant in the next 20 years for an economically going strong India. <coughs> teacher education, I will only quickly go through this in the context of there are teachers here and you will be interested. The school teacher preparation will be done with the multidisciplinary university. One thing which is very clear to us is the current system of teacher education needs to be completely revamped. The teachers have to be grown in the best of the institutions in the country under an environment where you have the best of the staff, best of the disciplines available and the best in way in which the knowledge is passed on for them to so that the next generation will take advantage of that kind of a broad knowledge, a deep knowledge, critical knowledge and the ability to convey that knowledge through pedagogical approaches and so on and so forth. So that is exactly the spirit of doing this in mounting you into the multidisciplinary universe. Ultimately, the best of the Indian, the, in, the teachers of India, whether it's school or colleges or higher education, will certainly have to come out of higher education as the product of the higher education and not through some single subject colleges, uh, TEIs and things of that kind. BED will be an undergraduate program of the study of covering both disciplinary and teacher preparation courses. 
all subjects including arts of sports vocational education special education they are all mainstream on par with other undergraduate degrees dj degrees will be eligible for masters they can also go for masters and degrees and the current two year bed program will continue until 2030 after 2030 only those institution offering four year teacher education these multidisciplinary universities or institution can offer this two year course also because there is no reason why this this when you have to have a four year program that the two year becomes a subset and certainly the quality and the standard that we want to maintain will make sure that we go to this kind of institution also for the two year program no other kind of pre service teacher preparation program will be offered and uh, for 23 certainly there are p- very interested teacher teachers who like to be a, a passion for teaching they have done very well through other streams of education there are special provisions in the policy to deal with those kind of things it's not that this becomes a single track way in which the teachers are produced there are other way, ways in which this will be done but there are exceptions but there is a policy that is available to deal with those uh, situations substandard and dysfunctional teacher education institute we are coming back to this because there are very serious we are concerned about 17000 schools uh, school t- institutions are there about 10000 of them have the concerns of the type that we are talking about in the teachers educational institutions <laughs> integrating professional education this is an important area we are considered of course as of now there is no finality about how do you want to integrate professional education the important thing is this need to be looked in how do you look at the general stream of education and the professional education they can be brought together uh, in the broad area of agriculture law medical and technical but we have addressed this through separate sections on these four areas and these are written by of course the people who matter in their education in their respective subject for example professor madhav menon before his recent death he is the one who formulated what should be how do we integrate the law and legal education into the general education and the so or so of yapan and a team of people from iari looked at the agricultural education and the medical doctor devi shetty and a team of people from some of the best doctors in india who are in the education field too they came in and technical education primarily was done by the indian national academy of engineering uh, set of people all institutions offering offering either professional or general education must organically evolve into institutions offering both by 2030 that is the other part of it and stand alone technical universities health science universities legal and agricultural universities or institutions in these and other field will expand organically into general education so these are some of the things but these need to be pursued further separate committee has been created because the when it comes to professional education there are other issues that need to be the question can be asked where is the time for a liberal arts study and we so sponsor about that when you have to do very heavy work related to your own profession like a doctor preparing for getting an mbbs degree so there are questions of this kind we need to find what is the best way to synergize it which are the one they are left alone because they are uniqueness of the profession where they come together <coughs> these need to be studied empowered governance i have this is this is a very important area in our view the question of autonomy all higher education will be governed by independent boards that will have, we have in mind institutions like indian institute of science uh, iits this institution some of these kind of a thing autonomy must percolate downwards across all levels of management formation and appointment of committees and vice chancellors to ensure elimination of external interference all institution free to start and run programs decide curricula fix free uh, fees access to students develop internal systems for governance and people management and affiliation to stop this is one of the key recommendation we have made affiliated colleges will develop into autonomous colleges degree granting colleges affiliating universities will develop into vibrant and multidisciplinary institutions those of the affiliated colleges if they cannot become autonomous or get integrated into a university system within 10 years they have to reconfigure themselves to a more meaningful educational exercise which will come out of the experience of the rest of the system running it uh, otherwise they have to be closed down that is what our recommendation is on the affiliated institution higher education governance and regulation the important aspect is we have now separated out the regulation 
from the other functions in a governance system for the higher education standard setting funding accreditation and regulation they are to be separated conducted by independent bodies eliminating concentration of power and conflicts of interest national higher education regulatory authority single regulator for all higher education including professional education regulation to be minimal and enabling willful for borders to be weeded out university grants commission will transform into higher edu education grants council the new general education council uh, this is a new uh, council will develop national higher education qualification framework and specify standards for general education accreditation will be the basis of further regulation nac will oversee this develop an ecosystem of sufficient accreditation institutions all other regulatory bodies whether it is mci aict nct bci and others they become standard setting bodies common regulatory regime for public and private institutions now i will not i will say, I'll not go too much into the remaining part because the time is out we are of course touched in a very serious way what is the role of educational technology integrating technology into all levels of education we have suggested improving the teaching learning process approaching the teacher education educational access to disadvantaged group streaming education and plan stream learning education planning and so on also we have made we have recommended a new national education technology forum to be set up with the following this thing provide independent evidence based advice to central and state governments on technology based intervention what are the problems with the introduction of technology is there is not much familiarity with the impact of the technology with respect to the problem that you are trying to address this is not only in education we have seen this in many other segments of the national endeavor the question is who can evaluate who can look at the appropriate of this how it can be considered for india as something more appropriate maybe it succeeded in norway but doesn't mean that it succeeds in india so you need an objective evaluation of the different approaches of technology how do we make appropriate selection how do we do it proof of test concept its implications are not only with respect to increasing the improving the efficiency of the education per se there are psychological effects Uh, there are financial effects strategic effects. there are many other dimensions with respect to the use of technology within which if for a particular endeavor and education is no exception to this and that's why we have suggested a national educational technology forum uh, to be a body to be the repository of all the information analytical capability to look at the pros and cons and make recommendations to the various bodies with respect to the type of best choices of education and keep a track on the evolution of these kind of a thing a national repository of education data records related to institution teachers and students in digital form i should say that our database is really very weak and in fact we have to create a good policy for the country you do need good databases their trend and many other kind of thing to be analyzed and we do find that there are deficiencies in the system we have now made a very strong plea for this national repository of educational data integration of vocational education i did say that even right from the last four years of a school education to a bachelor of vocational education in the undergraduate program for three years these are ways in which we have tried to bring in the edu vocational education but within the ambit of a general education system and bring in the knowledge base of the other areas into making the vocational education more meaningful and occasional education i don't have to say here is a fast changing area the fast changing area and in fact we kind of we need people uh, who today are uh, the, who who are trying to study areas in the bachelors and masters with even research degrees the knowledge levels are going up the demands are going up so we think that the integration is a very important component of ensuring that the maximum multiplicity of whether it's polytechnic the the uh, iti's and uh, then industries then the governmental institutions and also the higher education institution we need to come together to see what is the best way to push the vocational education within the framework of national committee for integration of vocational uh, education we will oversee this effect uh, effort and national skills qualification framework will be detailed at least for 100 to start with and then try to see how this integration could be done so this is a major exercise that is pending we have highlighted the issues of policies in this and uh, they need to be carried forward adult education i won't say much about it 
there are some standard procedures we have identified with respect to bringing in 100% youth and adult literacy by 2030. Promotion of Indian languages and languages has been banned, even though, even though this particular policy, when it was put in the public domain, it started with a language controversy. The actual language chapter, if you really look at it, it was not addressing those kind of things. It was looking at how do you strengthen the language learning and language research in this country, a country with enormous amount of uh, classical languages as its heritage. It's a country with, uh, uh, with uh, the different state languages and then of course you have some very commonly spoken languages and then the need for foreign languages like any so what kind of strategy we need to adopt and also the importance of focusing on language literature scientific vocabulary in indian languages and the national institutes for some of the classical languages like pali persian and prakrit and of course creating an indian institute of translation and interpretation and these are you but also for foreign languages i think if you really critically review the state of language learning the possibilities the infrastructure the type of teachers and the need in the emerging India, we find that there is a major disconnect and that is why a very specific recommendation is made with regard to the promotion of India, Indian languages, uh, which we think is very critical at this stage of India's uh, development. I conclude this with the transforming education. I said so much about the fact that uh, it's going to be all encompassing, it is flexible, but at the same time, it is interconnected and those kind of a thing. There are 19 and our departments of the government of India which carry on education and there are many cases in which the connectivity is missing, linkages are missing and also this kind of a program needs several structural changes, institutional changes, many times cultural changes, financial approaches and things of that kind. So I think we think the first 10 years will be very critical in addressing the issues coming out of this document and the type of policies that we have enunciated would need direction from the highest level. And also bringing in several institutions and departments of the government together to look at it in a cohesive and coherent manner. And that is where we have recommended a Rashtriya Shiksha Ayog, a National Education Commission. And this of course will be a very, the, the apex body for visualizing the education for this country making the necessary changes in the policies and directions and also creating the necessary framework for carrying this out. And we have recommended that it should be recited over by none other than the Prime Minister himself and with the next level which will be an executive committee which is used by the Ministry of Human Resource Development which we want to redesignate as a Ministry of Education. And lastly a third level in which there will be an advisory council we should really look at what is appropriate for India at every stage of the its uh, pro, uh, development. And this will have even experts from all over the world, the best of the experts from all over the world in the area of education and related matters. So in a three-tier system, we have tried to recommend, we also recommend that we do know that uh, this, is, is, this is a concurrent subject between the state and the governor center. So state will set up parallel systems within their own state with respect to whatever they are applicable, ensuring that they have their autonomy in decision making. And we have made sure that uh, they are not in conflict, but they are they will can st uh, strengthen each other's role in the context of promoting education uh, through this kind of an institutional mechanism. This is something we have just now, we, we have put this as a major recommendation recognizing the complexity of what is in store for implementing this and also the type of levels of decision that you need to take uh, in making certain changes in, in the overall structure of this uh, uh, governance in the country. I conclude this, it's, it's, a very, it's, a, it's not it's a more philosophical rather than a pragmatic one, in every, in every epoch of humankind, knowledge represents the sum total of what is created by all previous generations to which the present generation adds its own. The motif of the Mobius strip, we have put the Mobius strip as the kind of a symbol for this document, symbolizes the perpetual developing and live nature of knowledge, that which has no beginning and that which has no end. This policy envisages creation, transmission, use and dissemination of knowledge as a part of this continuum. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for the illuminating lecture, elaborating on the components of in the new.
education policy that we have to bring more for higher education. And I think that is the university. I thank you very much. And I am sure there will be, uh, you will be ready to get the question. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I will be next to open for somebody to have some any clarification to your uh, I think I congratulate sir your team that you have put the systems thinking I call it education. We have looked at the integrations of various levels together and seen that they flow actually when they have to get a picture of the It definitely reflects your ISO background of common power. I have been looking at uh, education models of education almost from 2005. Uh, under Professor Mehta, he was the chairman of IIT Jodhpur, I was the director. We tried to create a department less institute, but there are no boundaries there. We had attempted systems thinking of this approach. I moved to the Alpha Education Institute and I think you were once invited from conversations of people in the that you could not see. And I send you an invitation again. 90% of what you have mentioned is being implemented and practiced in that institute for the last 40 years. So I am very happy to see this uh, new education policy coming. The same thing, the report. Uh, Today we are presenting on the evaluation reforms written by me and my team. So there will be the features for which this workshop has been conducted. We are also pleading and asking people to look at if a student can do a course, one from commerce faculty, one from science faculty, and one from social science And what kind of a degree will you get? Whether we give a PA, we give a BCom, or we give a BSc. So I think what I find when I ran through a big document, these degree issues must also be kept in mind. A single statement that in fact that wherever the student takes an action, let it be your secret level. Because right now these solos of degrees of BSc and BA, BCom and all will restrict a lot of what we have presented here. So I don't know whether I am a big part of thinking, but we have been debating the last two years. We have already implemented skilling and general education integration with literal entities, multiple entities, multiple state, even diagonal movement, not only upward and horizontal. And the model people can come and see. The purpose should be the student should not go on the roadside and stand and get into drugs. They should remain within the educational institute. So it's a matter of developing character along with the knowledge. To me, that's important. The only component I find which has not been addressed explicitly, implicitly, is there. How do you do? You have talked about physical development, you have talked about mental development or a cognitive development, but you have not talked explicitly about spiritual development in this policy. I think there's a need, and in India as a background, this should come up. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Are you responding or can I make my comment at first? Hanuman Chaudhary, Chairman of Rajya Bharati. First, I would like to compliment Dr. Kasturi Rangan. You may kindly recall that the Pratyah Bharati has honored you by conferring an award, Pratyah Bhavan, a few years ago. Sir, the most important indication is at the primary and the secondary stage. I am sorry to observe that it is in this sector that you have been destroying education completely. 42% of the people, of the children, who should be in the primary and secondary schools are not in government schools, they are in private schools. And today, some of the chief ministers in certain states are saying that English medium should be there from infant stage onwards. 
So the Anganwadi maids are being taught English, what type of English, so that they will converse with the infants in the Anganwadis in English and prepare them for English medium education. So I think the most important recommendation for you should, should have been that the primary and the secondary education should be only in government institutions, high schools and not in any private schools. The China education that is there in the southern states, China means Chaitanya and Narayana. <laughs> These people are preparing people only how to pick up answers to the questions and not as we aspire. Theo Yonaha Prachodaya. If there is the intelligence that is inherent in every human being, that is the purpose of education. Dr. Prabhupati K.M. Munshi founded the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan. Bharatiya, that is the adjective, Vidya Bhavan in the 1930s, so that Indians post in independence shall be producers of knowledge, producers of knowledge based upon the great heritage of India, that's why he called it Bharati Vidya to distinguish it from the other Vidyas. So, so first thing is that the primary and secondary education should be only in the, in the government sector. Now, we have a creation of knowledge. Gandhi Jalandigo said, all higher education should be only in the private sector, maybe under the control of the government. Now, take for example the GCS. I am a fellow of the GCS. Yet, every year it makes about 30,000 crores of net profits. The other IT companies are making from 20,000 to 30,000. Only the pro spends on education. So one of the incentives, one of the policies should be that all companies which make sober profits must invest them in the human resource development. <laughs> Nani Parikhiwala made this observation. History will record that the greatest mistake of the Indian Republic in the first 50 years, we can add in the 70 years also, is not putting enough investment in human resource development. And, and that is education and health. That continues. That is why. Although we have been saying, Prime Minister, Prime Minister that 2% of the GDP should be invested in knowledge creation, that is R&D, as you have said, it is only 0.8. And South Korea spent 4.5% of poor, and that is why almost wonderful things are coming from those two small countries. Now, I would suggest, now, in the latest budget, is a Robin Hood tax has been imposed. That is, high network network individuals, they so called surcharge. It is estimated to bring in 20,000, 12,000 crores of rupees at the current level. I would suggest, I have made a suggestion that it should not be a, it should be a cess and not a surcharge. It should be constituted in the application, human resource development fund. And it is it should be invested to start new schools at the primary and the secondary and improve the existing schools. Sir, imagine after independence, did any of the Indian scientists get a Nobel Prize? But Indians who have gone outside India have got that one. So we have to invest if the government funds are not sufficient. The companies which are making more than 1,000 crores of rupees of net profit every year must be compulsory required to invest in human resource development. I will give the example of, and with that I will finish so that others will have a chance. I am from the telecommunications. We made a 5% cess on the revenues of the telecom companies. It amounted to 1 lakh plus crores of rupees. It is that money which is utilized to take to 250,000 panchayat villages broadband. Similarly, this super surcharge should be considered to be set and entrusted to a committee of trustees 
to invest in education. This is the, there are other sessions which I am waiting and presenting to you. My Prajna Bharati is holding a meeting on the 30th of this month, a round table to discuss this report and offer further session. Thank you. I am Dr. S. Rupendra Shastri, working as Nodal Officer at the most prestigious Hindi Mahavicharya, which has completed, which is going to complete 60 years this year. We are extremely grateful to Professor Kasto Raghurji and uh, his team of members for having given us a wonderful joy education policy, uh, which has made the most valuable suggestions for taking our great India to further heights. But with your kind permission, sir, I have a doubt whether can we expect uh, to enjoy the fruits of this new education policy. I don't know, guys, the education is in the concrete list of both state and central governments. The central government has been envisaging so many new policy initiatives, but ultimately the state governments are given a freedom whether to implement it or not, it is not mandatory for the state governments. For example, the UGC has announced so many useful measures for the enhancement of retirement age of teachers, for the appointment of teachers by following some criteria, but we know pretty well that these things are not followed in true letter and speech. And due to the liberal financial assistance given by the UGC, several colleges have infrastructurally and economically grown beyond the expectations of even the government. But due to the privatization policy, pursued by the government. Now, these barriers which are made to develop are infrastructurally and as well as academically, you know what is my intention. So, I, my sincere request with Sri Kasturi Rangandi is by organizing this type of workshops, you also should be ready to suggest to the government of India to see that the institutions which are allowed to grow with the public, with the support of public bank, they should be allowed to render the services as the public funded institutions, not private institutions. If the suggestions are made by the committee, I think uh, the new education policy will go to the, will reach uh, to many unreached sections. I think you got the spirit of my feeling and uh, definitely this policy will help us because the contextual appointments are to be phased out. This is a wonderful suggestion. Because without full-time appointments, how can we expect a full-time commitment on the part of the teachers? And I think uh, Kasko Ranganji, by using all his good offices, will prevail upon the government to see that the part-time and ad hoc appointments are totally abolished by the government, especially under the dynamic leadership of Sri Narendra Modi ji, who is the, our Prime Minister, and uh, unless the education system is revamped, the country cannot expect any development. I request you, sir, to kindly say that the bottom and ad hoc appointments are immediately stopped with, so that the society, the people of this society will definitely get their hopes fulfilled. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Respected Chairman, sir, we have one submission to make. Excuse me. First of all, we would like to thank you for having organized this open house session. And we also would like to thank UGC South Southern Regional Office for having organized this session. So particularly taking input from students, faculty, it would have been appropriate before meeting the draft. If this would have been organized, it would have been appreciated even more. However, uh, but we would like to place few of our concerns uh, in our meeting. If security personnel can kindly refuse me from this thing, I just would place one submission. One submission, question is there. Please allow, please allow, can you bring in that paper and submit to it? Sir, uh, our submission.
is that there are contradictory uh, provisions or statements that have been made in the report. On one hand, the report talks about inclusivity in principle. While on the other hand, it also gives leverage for private institutions to charge fees as they wish to because it gives a free clause in that. In this very state, in the, in the city of Hyderabad, there was one student, IDP, who was institutionally murdered just because she was a class 9 student and she belongs to the class community since, and she was also a social welfare scholarship holder. Since she could not afford to pay her examination fees, she was denied writing appearing for examination since her entire hopes were shattered in pursuing education. It was because of the corporate uh, interest that led to the institutional murder of Sai DK class and these incidents have been repeating from uh, quite many years. Alongside, so with this sort of uh, uh, incorporation, would it not give private institutions their own hand to leverage these at their own interest instead of the interest of the student community as, as one expert has very rightly pointed out that it should be free and in fact it defeats the purpose of right to education act. And on second principle, sir, and we are standing at the at the Sanskrit Fully Auditorium of University of Hyderabad. In fact, this university has witnessed quite many institutional murders starting from Sendil Kumar, Balraju, Madhari, Vekatesh, and Rohit Bemula, and also one more student, Ashita, who has recently uh, died in this very same university. Now the problem is, sir, the institutions are not developing adequate mechanisms as far as orienting the faculty is concerned, as far as orienting the students is concerned. In fact, Honorable Supreme Court has recently opined that merit is defined on the terms as to how inclusivity is being perceived and not in terms of vague senses that have been uh, orchestrated across the country. And taking by this standard, it would have been more appropriate instead of suggesting for a certificate course for faculty, it would have been more appropriate to have suggested for developing mechanisms which would prevent these sorts of caste, class, prejudices that exist in this country. It to, to suggest for punishments for anyone in, in any ranks. Who practices these forms of discrimination in the institution and orientations for faculty are being going on for in the campus. This demand has been there, but orientations of faculty is necessary. And look at one point of view, you definitely uh, pointed out that the need for orientation on inclusivity. However, if that is made as a mandatory clause, perhaps then you could institutions act on these forms of uh, prejudices that exist in the Please, please give. Uh, I want to only tell you, public institution, one of the biggest uh, importance of this, which people don't point out, they simply pick up private and public, is the fact that the public funding to education, we want to double. You know its implications. When you try to say the gross national expenditure, we want to take it to 20% from the present 10 percent and in a domain where our economy itself may be 5 trillion in the next 2-3 years, it's a money that will satisfy the needs of the many segments of the society. If you take that into account, along with several sections of the document in which the question of how do we deal with underprivileged classes, underprivileged geographies and the, 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 the tribal education. If you look at it, in fact, if you look at the details of the tribal education, it was formulated by the university whose vice chancellor is a tribal, in a tribal university. That is the type of things we have taken care of. So I want to assure you, this we have been very sensitive to the points you have mentioned. This is very much in our mind. We have articulated it within the framework of the document, which is a, it's a document, it is not one of the specific areas, this area, that area, this area. Within that framework, we think we have addressed the concerns which we thought will certainly come up in this country, a country with such a varied and plurality. We need to address this kind of a thing. So we can be rest assured to the best of our ability, we have taken that into account. You give your paper, we will certainly seriously study. There is a committee which is going to go into it and see what we can do. I assure you on that. Much of the public by the chairman of the 
In that condition, they were talking about 5 to 10 miles within which one school complex will be there. And in this for this graph, there is no, uh, I mean, there is nowhere it has been mentioned about the radius in which this school complex will be uh, uh, operating. So I want the clarification on that. And on higher education, uh, there is, I mean, uh, there was this uh, multiple exit options which we are which you are talking about during your uh, uh, lecture. So how is it viable when we have different course structure all through the country? And I mean, if, if I study in Hyderabad Central University, there is a different course structure, and if I study in JNU, it's a different course structure. So how can I take an exit after one year and join some other institute? So how is this going to be viable? And uh, I would like to give the mic to. Uh, can I, can I, can, hello, hello. And I want them to ask you questions. I have a Are you? Sir, I have a question for you, sir. There is directly come to question. Sir, when in India, the last 30 years, the problem that our schooling is seeing is lack of faculty, lack of teachers. And majority of teachers are direct teachers. Now the problem that all the teachers are discussing is single and double school teachers. This Rather than addressing that problem, this document is that it might be a single school and double school teacher by coming with the idea of school complex in rural, rural India where the transportation problem. How can this school complex address it? For second, is the role of India just teaching the classroom at the primary and secondary level? Is that it's a doing the student? So coming to the uh, second question that is about between me and the introduction of breakfast. The document categorically says banana and the milk should be served. Banana and milk both are very stable and India is a country where more than 65% of the population is non-vegetarian. What are the things that pose committee categorically mentions banana and milk instead of egg that is easy to serve, efficient and cheap also. And then coming to the third question about the higher education. All the discussions in air is about the autonomy. At that time, this document is saying moving from UGC, that is University Grant Commission, to NSGI government. National Higher Education Regulatory Authority. So why, when the uh, any discussion about autonomy, giving autonomy to the institutions, then there is a grant commission and this document is saying move from grant commission and see an uh, institute has autonomy and the UGC is there to fund that. From there to regulatory authority, that should regulate academic as well as financing of institutions. Thank you, sir. Uh, first, let me tell you about these complexes. You know, the, the question of Making sure that we have an optimal. Are you going away after asking the questions? Hello. Uh, shall, shall we answer the question? The question. The question. The answer is the complex is a concept. The concept comes in because there are distributed systems like primary schools, preschools, uh, secondary schools and uh, higher schools. Now, the question of how they are distributed, what is the optimality of distances, what is the level of students available there, what is its projection for the next 10 years and what kind of teachers are needed for that and what are the local customs. These are the questions to be analyzed. What you are trying to do is, even your question is only the tip of the iceberg of the problem that we have have in mind. So don't simplify it as an answering your question is going to solve the problem. It is not. It has a multiple levels of that. But that doesn't mean that there are locations in the country where this formula, this approach can be adopted in the next one or two years. So those locations will be identified first. The first level of its implementation will be tried out. The implication in terms of the logistics, the ability to the pragmatism, and the type of way in which they work together as a complex system, these will be evaluated. It could be that every state may have two or three complexes of this type, not, not hundreds of complexes overnight. So this is the first thing. And so first of all, it is not an overnight solution. It has to be gradually evaluated. There are locations in this country where this country criteria can be applied. They would be chosen, evaluated and the necessary changes to be made. Then ultimately, then we will see what is the best solution to use this concept. This is an exercise which involves both getting the data, analyzing the data, developing a strategy based on the data. There are the local issues, 
there are the regional issues and then there are national issues. They have to be all folded into it. So please don't take this such a recommendation as the one which can be directly translated into near your village. You have a situation like this, it's not applicable. This is not the way in which the formulation is done. So this will be done on a step-by-step -step process and by evaluation where it is feasible and ultimately how to scale it up. We will look at it, the methods of, if necessary, if there are problems of schools not viable, we will create the schools where they become useful to the students at that place. And there are places in which the villages have disappeared. And so, if you put a construct up there, under Sarvashita Abhyan, you try to put a school there, uh, it doesn't make a difference. So, these questions are coming out of certain types of decisions that have been taken and the changes that have occurred dynamically corresponding to those decisions. That is number one. The number two is with respect to the higher education. But I tell you that complex idea is a very significant idea. It has to be tested out. It, the way to scale it up has to be checked. This is the only way in which the concept of this particular uh, document with regard to providing a holistic education at the school level and creating even youngsters who can follow their own vocations even after schooling is possible. It just is not possible otherwise. So that is one thing. And so we have to create that situation where it is not possible. The second thing is, what, what did you say about the um, uh, midday meal or whatever it is? Please don't, if, if by state, state, this is a concurrent list I told you, the breakfast is not excluded from the concurrent list. You can have eggs and the, if the local people feel that the eggs and uh, milk is a better combination that they can, the economics permit you, please go ahead and do. Just because a banana has said, I have not even said whether it is a plantain or whether it is a smaller banana, we have not said anything. It is just an example that you put. So you decide what you want to give, what is good. So go to a nutrition expert, say what is best for these local students and what is economically viable. How can it be stored, transported and logistics? Please address those questions. These are the good questions you are asking. And between you are also the solutions. Please do that. That is not the issue. This is, this is also a community role in trying to bring this up. That is the second point. The third is with respect to the higher education. What is the higher education you wanted to check? Huh? Ah, multiple exit. There are many places in which the people are making multiple exits anyhow. But they are not able to come back. That is the main problem, right? What we have tried to do is to enable them to come back. What is so cr criminal about the fact that somebody can get out and get into the education? Even today I keep reading. I could not at this age of 80, could have done this without learning anyhow. So there is a multiple, I made a multiple entry into education again. So this is not something very esoteric. Please don't look this as esoteric. Just because you use the word multiple exit, multiple entry. This should be there in the system. If it is not there, we will have facilitate it. What is wrong in it? Thank you very much, sir. I, I, I would like to close this and because there can be so many... Uh, Autonomy is a must. There can be so many queries as all of us know. This document, this document, the suggestions on this document can always be submitted by individuals or organizations or institutions or academies. That is open for all of us to submit. And if uh, some of you feel it is pressing, and if you want this to be communicated to University of Hyderabad or this public lecture, please submit to University of Hyderabad Vice Chancellor's office. I will collect all of them and submit to process uh, customer London for it to be considered for when they are going to deliberate on the suggestions that are received from different partners. And I am sure I, all of you will agree with me that it has been a wonderful lecture and a wonderful interactive session. And thank you, thank you to all of you. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk. And if I, I would like to have a small privilege to honor you with a, a small memento from you, Mr. Hyderabad. Please come. Respected Dr. Kastu Dangan, Speaker of the Day, Vice Chancellor, Professor Aparo Pudli, and respected 
vice chancellors former vice chancellors academicians students and delegates who are attending this ugc workshop so on behalf of university of hyderabad on my personal behalf we would like to wholeheartedly thank dr kasur rangan for giving us lot of insights on draft national education policy and also making the session more interactive answering so many concerns and giving us lot of optimism that this new education policy is going to really change the system and he proposed about the the policy proposed about three arts one is readjustment revamping and reenergizing in the beginning of the session dr kasturangan said the policies are fine but execution is a issue we hope this policy is going to have a better execution if really it is executed and the way it is promised i think most of the concerns of the students and society will be answered and there are various issues about uh, multi disciplinary university and also we have spoke about research university and uh, for the information of uh, audience here our university of hyderabad has about 40% of our students are research students we have lot of mphil and phd students and mtech students and the integrated program we have started 12 13 years ago and we also have some exit class in our integrated program so lot of uh, things proposed here we are very happy that our university has been following for the past 45 years the semester system choice based credit system now the outcome based education most of the things are in place in university and we are still we are evolving and we are trying to improve it uh, with this uh, positive hope whatever you have given us we would like to we wish to become a world class university and i thank once again for sparing your valuable time for traveling all the way from bangalore and educating us and giving us lot of information about the policy and also clarifying lot of concerns of our students and i also thank ugc uh, for giving us the opportunity for allowing their teachers also part of their participants also to be part of this program where we would like to disseminate the information about policy to all the delegates who are attending this workshop i also thank our university authorities students and non teaching staff for making this program as a grand success thank you very much